Okay. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's lecture um, of the series FAU against CO2. And I'm happy to be the moderator today. I'm Magdalena, and I study psychology at FAU. And yeah, we are very happy today to have Professor Jens Hesselbjerg Christensen uh, from the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, here today. Um, Thank you very much um, for sharing some of your knowledge with us um, to the topic elements for the creation of IPCC reports as seen from the perspectives of a physical climate scientist. And yeah, it's an honor to have you here today. Um, before I say something more about our lecture, I give some information about the technical uh, stuff and organization. And we will uh, have the lecture recorded and in the end we will upload it in the FAU video portal and also you will get the slides uploaded and yeah it can take some time um yeah about the course of the lecture so we have 60 minutes for the lecture and 30 minutes for questions and if you have any questions during the lecture um please write them in, your, in the Q&A box and we will discuss them at the end and we are always happy about many questions, so I encourage you just to write them in the Q&A box. And also you can vote questions up um, so that the interesting questions uh, are at the top and I can ask them. And yeah, also I hope you take part in the demographic survey. And later on, maybe uh, Professor Christensen will also um, have a survey. And yeah, there you can also, I hope you will take part. Um, and if you have anything else or any feedback, you also can share it in the chat. Um, yeah, but only the, the questions are for the Q&A box. And to our guest today, as I said, um, Professor Christensen is from the Niels Bohr Institute in Climate Physics at the University of Copenhagen, and also works as a research professor for NOS research in Bergen, Norway, and as a visiting scientist for the Danish Meteorological Institute, and he was also the research director at the Meteorological Institute. And four years ago, he went back to university. And his expertise focuses on atmospheric physics, climate change adaptation, and pre precipitation and hydrology. Um, he got his PhD in astrophysics, also from the University of Copenhagen, and has worked as a consultant for the World Bank and as a visiting scientist for the Meteorological Institute in Toulouse in France. And he also wrote about 250 publications and contributions to IPCC reports. Yeah, so uh, we're very happy to have you. <laughs> and yeah, without further ado, I hand over to Professor Christensen. Well, thank you very much. And that uh, I also feel it, uh, a kind of honor to be able to share my experience with uh, a diverse group of uh, audience. I noticed some of your answers that although most of you come from engineering and natural sciences, I also saw that there were um, others, other fields represented. And I, I think strongly this, this is important in terms of exactly the, the topic that I'm, I'm about to talk about. So, um, the uh, the idea of uh, of this series of lectures, I suppose, is that one lastly it has to give it uh, some a, a broad view of uh, how uh, community moves forward. What's happening in terms of uh, uh, our our planet? How do we actually uh, react? And and uh, to a large extent, what is it that the, the background that we can react on? And so what I, I'm, I plan to do is that I would uh, very briefly talk about what the IPCC is, um, mainly working group one, which is uh, the part that I have been involved, engaged in, which is uh, the physical climate system. And um, then I will talk more specifically about uh, producing the reports that's uh, the central element of the activities with the IPCC which uh, has to do with how how the an, an entire report in, in these very big settings as you will hopefully realize uh, 
it is demanding and uh, it, it needs a lot of planning, including that if you are selected and becoming uh, engaged with this, uh, particularly if you have a leading role, it's, it's a, it requires a very detailed planning uh, because of the huge interactions and uh, involvement with a lot of people. And then I will spend some time or see on how one can best organize the work in this. So it's, a, it's not only to produce reports, but as you would realize that writing things together typically will mean that you also need to have some um, uh, social relationship that gives you enough uh, credibility with one another and you have trust to, to your uh, fellow authors in the sense that you rely on that their expertise can actually deliver what's supposed to be delivered. I will then take you through a little bit about how the report is being created, the, the, the number of drafts that are being produced, the zero order, first order, second order draft, and, and the final product, which is the uh, summary for policymakers and uh, a, a technical summary. And eventually there is a, a final step, which I will not spend so much time on, is that what's called the synthesis report. So, so that was sort of, this, this, these are the elements that uh, you will see here. But before doing that, I'll just give you uh, if, uh, I've, what I think is the uh, outcome of previous IPCC report in a nutshell. So when IPCC was established in the light, uh, late 80s, uh, the first report from IPCC was issued in 1990. And here there is a quote from this report saying, we are certain that these increases in greenhouse gas concentrations, in parentheses, will enhance the greenhouse effect, resulting on average in an additional warming of the Earth's surface temperature. Um, science went on, and uh, decision makers, as we will come back to, uh, wanted to have yet another report. And uh, again, from Working Group 1, the, the contribution the second assessment report uh, came up with a, a statement goes this way, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible, discernible human influence on climate, on global climate. Um, moving forward in 2001, and uh, this is the first time I was directly uh, more heavily involved with as a lead author, uh, one of the statements there is that there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. And as uh, years went on and another report was issued in 2007, where it's now was uh, central to say that discernible human influences now extend to other aspects of climate, including ocean warming, continental average temperatures, temperature extreme and wind patterns. And uh, in 2013, the statement was, human influence on the climate system is clear. This is evident from increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, positive radiative forcing, observed warming, and understanding of the climate system. And uh, there is a new report almost ready. Uh, it has to be approved. And I will come back to uh, in a while what this means. And that will be issued starting with the contribution from Working Group 1 by the early August this year. So everything is ready and, and set to go, but it has to be uh, approved at the, a plenary meeting in the IPCC. And I will uh, touch upon what that means uh, during this lecture. Uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, I, I became came involved in this with the third assessment report, but it goes a little further back actually because uh, I started my career within climate science in 1990 when I was hired at the Meteorological Institute in, in Copenhagen uh, at a European project which was called the Climate of the 21st Century, and uh, that was my shift from astrophysics into climate science. Um, my skills there were actually not because of my climate science understanding. It was because at the time I was uh, seen as a good programmer. So that meant that I could do uh, programming work for which is very much needed if you want to do climate modeling, which is my 
main theme scientifically. Um, but already uh, in the 1995 report, I was engaged in some work where I was invited to small, write a small contribution, which is called to be a contributing author. And this was uh, my first encounter with the IPCC. I had very little knowledge about what IPCC was. I just thought that it was interesting and relevant to submit my tiny bit to this one. Then I was invited for um, to become a lead author uh, for the third assessment report, which was uh, issued in 2001. And there was a chapter on regional climate information, evaluation and projections. I was uh, uh, participating as well in the team. Uh, I was not at this stage uh, engaged in, in, in coordinating and leading the work, but that happened for the Force assessment report in 2007, where a, a, a regional chapter now focusing on projections only was uh, part of that report. And here I was a, a leading or coordinating lead author, which uh, was repeated in, in AR5, where uh, yet another uh, regional climate chapter was issued. This time a little more complex in the sense that it was the title is climate phenomena and their relevance for future regional climate change. Uh, anyway, these are these were sort of my history involved in this. And actually, for the fifth assessment report, I was also engaged with what is called an atlas, which is just a, a collection of maps that you can zoom in over various parts of, of the world to see how climate models are uh, projecting the future. And for this upcoming uh, report, I'm not a, an author. I'm, I have the role of what's called a review editor on uh, an atlas and, and yet another atlas but this time there will be an interactive part so there will be an online version uh, which we believe would be uh, very much of a reference uh, for, for future work so that's the IPCC information can now be seen at, at a website. This engagement uh, I just want to put into the perspective of, of how IPCC has uh, developed and you must excuse me, I'm, I'm sitting at home, so now my dog is barking. But I'm sure you're used to these uh, uh, interruptions from people's children and animals and such like. In 1988, IPCC was initiated by the WLO and uh, UNEP, which are both organizations under the UN. WMO is the World Meteorological Organization and UNEP is the UN Environmental Program. Uh, so in the 80s, the, there was a strong focus on environmental issues uh, worldwide uh, for the first time. Before that, it was really, I would say, very sporadic what there was in terms of, of international collaboration on the environment. And in fact, back in, in the 80s, there were still many countries in Europe which did not even have an environmental uh, ministry. So this, this was rather new. And the issue related to issues related to climate change were on the agenda. And this, this led to this uh, establishment of the IPCC. Uh, the tasks were said to be uh, to assess on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis, the scientific, technical and socioeconomic information relevant to understanding the scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change, its potential impacts and options for adaptation and mitigation. So uh, a long sentence here, but um, the bottom line of this is that it's, it's the whole story about climate change that is on, on, the, on the agenda for the IPCC. It's not just um, natural science or, or the, the vulnerability and issues related to the risk related to climate change but it's the the whole uh, set of uh, research agendas that uh, relates into the climate change discussions the uh, ipcc bases its assessment mainly on peer-reviewed and published scientific technical literature and the role uh, organization participation and general procedures they can be found uh, in a document that's called Principled Covering IPCC Work. I won't go into details of this. This was not the purpose of, 
of this lecture. But, but of course, there are certain uh, boundaries and elements on how the IPCC works, and particularly how the author themes are being put together. That's all uh, described uh, and how it should be done. And it's also important to stress that the IPCC as such does not carry out research, nor does it monitor climate related data or any other relevant parameters. So, so IPCC is a truly intergovernmental panel. Uh, so, so the work comes from the reports that are being um, issued and the report since the an intergovernmental inst uh, organization not necessarily has the expertise that comes from inviting experts to do the work. So that's uh, that's actually not the IPCC. Those are the authors, and authors are only part of the IPCC as long as they write. So eventually, and currently, I'm not an author. I'm, I'm engaged with IPCC because I'm, I'm a review editor. But once the product is delivered, um, I will cannot consider myself as part of IPCC. That's really a intergovernmental body, meaning it's it's lastly civil servants uh, that that takes that role. It's organized in in a, in in the following way because, as uh, mentioned, uh, it's the whole agenda that relates to climate change, which is being uh, addressed and and uh, assessed by the IPCC reports. There are three working groups and, and a task force, and the task force is something that's uh, introduced a little later than, than the working groups. Working group one, which is uh, where I belong, is the assesses the scientific aspects of the climate system and climate change. Working group two assesses the vulnerability of socioeconomic and natural systems to climate change, negative and positive consequences of climate change, and options for ad adapting to it while working group three assesses options for limiting greenhouse gas emissions and otherwise mitigating climate change. So, so what you can see here is that there is a clear separation and all, very often that separation is not just in terms of uh, the focus of the science, but it's also on the disciplines. So, so working group one is largely related to, to natural sciences. Um, working group two is a, a mixed bag of natural sciences and uh, uh, social sciences, uh, humanities to some extent, uh, and working group three is largely social sciences. So, so that's a that's a, a split which has also have had its consequences in terms of making the reports linked, uh, particularly because there is this element that I mentioned, which is called the synergy report. So. Uh, as, as uh, the IPCC moved on and, and there was a, a, a need started to, to, to develop that it actually is possible to, to check what, uh, how much uh, greenhouse gases are being emitted and therefore this task force on national greenhouse gas inventories has, has been established as well. But I will not talk about that. It's, and the last thing I want to put in place, that's, uh, that's how, how does uh, the, the whole thing work. Um, the, 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 as a panel, intergovernmental panel, it meets in plenary about once a year, where it accepts, uh, approves, adopts reports and, and, and other businesses, decides some mandates and work plans uh, of the working groups and the task force. Uh, the structure and outlines of the reports are being discussed and approved and of course, every now and then there are more business things like principles, procedures, and even a budget. Uh, it elects a chair. So there is a chair that's typically uh, elected for a cycle of IPCC reports. That would mean from once the report has been handed in, there will be a new round uh, where a new chair is being elected. There's also a bureau, and the bureau uh, uh, on the uh, on the task force as well, and that's uh, that's a, a large uh, group of uh, typically scientists from the world uh, from across the world who has a, a background within climate science, but not necessarily climate science, that are assisting the chairs or the co-chairs in planning, coordination, and monitoring progress in the work. And uh, the 
in the end, the, the, there is a secretariat which is hosted by WMO, that's the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva. And uh, important as well are the so-called uh, working group task forces and technical support units. And particularly the, te te the, the, the technical support unit, that's where each of the working, the, the working groups are hosted. And typically that would be a, a, a national funding of a, an office or a, for, for the co-chairs. And typically that would be in a, uh, the co-chairs are chosen so that there will be one from a developed country and one from a developing country. And it's the, the, the funding of this support will go to the, the co-chair that comes from a developed country. And for working group one, this is, uh, this is with France now. A lot of what I will talk about is relating to one of the already, some would say outdated, uh, but it's actually not outdated, it's just not updated. So the conclusions from, from, work, from this uh, 14 years old report are still valid, most of them at least. And, and the reason why I would talk about these are because you would see that I have some detailed information that I managed to put together when I was involved in this one. But most importantly about the IPCC is, of course, that the, the whole thing is set up to, to in support for decision makers. It's, it's the UN system that has asked the scientific community to assess um, the, these uh, issues related to climate change. And therefore, the reports must be scientifically correct and use a precise language and they should be policy relevant. So if, if it, it fails on any of these three, then, then these reports would never have uh, been seen as an, as an important element as, as they have uh, managed to do over the, um, the years. So uh, if we to, uh, take uh, these three elements, uh, scientifically correct and precise language and policy relevant, that's, of course, for a scientist and then in natural science, then the, the, the first uh, element here is clear. That's something you would uh, feel is, is what you do every day on your, on your science. Uh, but at the same time, using precise language, that's not often the case that many of our colleagues are doing a very good language, using a very good language in ex trying to express what they they say you can use a lot of jargon, a lot of uh, elements that would say that this is significant or something like that, which nobody really knows what means. So that means that there has to be some, some a learning process by which you have to figure out how you use a, a language that everybody can agree on that this is precise. And being policy relevant is for many of uh, natural scientists, not the first thing that you think of when you start to do your research. And, and this is also where you immediately can see that the difference between doing a scientific, normal scientific work, which is uh, driven by a scientific research question and uh, curiosity driven very often, here it has to have a, a, a second element to it, it has to be policy relevant. So it must inform in a way that it gives something that can be acted upon. And of course, those statements I gave you in the beginning, uh, where we could see that we basically said this has been saying the same with the IPCC for all reports in terms of that uh, human are uh, affecting the climate system. That's of course a policy relevant statement because uh, this has implications which uh, I didn't mention here, but that's of course taking off by a particular working group too. And to deal with it and mitigate uh, these implications, that's working group three that would have to do this. And that's of course putting it forward in a policy relevant way, but without being prescriptive. So, so very often when, when it's uh, being stated that the IPCC was, is recommending this or that, that's actually not what's happening. It's, it's the facts that are put forward. And very often the facts are of a nature where you would say that it's obvious what should be done, but that's not the same as saying that this should be done. To produce these reports then, 
that uh, you can see that there are now five and actually six, then the whole setup is, uh, is, is, is about to start. And to, to do that, the working groups has a chair that's actually uh, elected by the uh, plenary chair and the co-chair, as, as I mentioned, one from a developed country and one from a developing country, typically. They will have the mandate to, uh, to lead the whole process of drafting these reports and uh, finally lead the me a meeting at the plenary where the reports can be approved. And uh, to do that, they invite in the scientific community uh, colleagues to, to do the assessment work. And there are three main authors involved. So the, uh, there's, there's a lead, uh, leading author, which is called the uh, Coordinating Lead Author, CLAs. That's, uh, there are two or two, three of these for each chapter who are responsible for coordinating the author team, ensuring balance across the chapter at developing an appropriate level of consistency in language and approach and ensuring that there are no gaps in coverage. So that's, uh, that's the coordination of the whole thing. That's keeping a, a, an eye on that the development and the, a, that the chapter is doing what it's supposed to do. And I need to close a window because somebody decided to start to cut the lawn next to me. I hope that helps on the sound. And uh, then a set of uh, lead authors that uh, should function as a team uh, and the chapter as a whole must represent a balanced of views of all the lead authors in summarizing the relevant understanding of the scientific community. And, and this, of course, would also imply that that should be good coverage from across the world. Uh, and as a UN body, that there will also be typical UN elements uh, involved so that there is a fair representation of gender of uh, uh, developing nations versus uh, developed nations. Um, that that's all these things are elements in the selection of the of these uh, lead authors and coordinating lead authors. On top of uh, being active and having a relevant CV to to the task. But even so that you have selected authors, there will often be elements that are beyond the expertise of these authors. And therefore the uh, uh, set of co contributing authors are typically invited to, to assist the writing team. And uh, they, they are more to, to provide specific technical information in the form of text, graphs, or material for a simulation by the lead authors into the drafts. So if, for example, there is an Let's assume again a, a regional chapter that if there is a focus on on uh, aspects in in Germany, but the team didn't have anybody with expertise from Germany, you will typically ask your German colleagues to see if they would like to contribute with some text on this. The whole process is in peer review, uh, and that there are uh, in, in principle three different uh, levels of, of, of the review. The first version of the report is called a zero order draft, um, which is subject to an informal review using expert reviewers nominated by the author teams themselves and the bureau. So that would mean that you write for your friends just to see if you cover anything. So that's, that's actually at the very early stage of the whole process. But once the team has been established, this, this zero order draft is being put together. And uh, that's, uh, that's just to make sure that the ideas that the authors have actually make sense and not big uh, gaps are there, which of course then would have to be taken up. And uh, typically the remedy would be to invite additional authors to be part of the team. And, and in this process with the zero order draft and then after this, a first order draft, which is subject to an open review, uh, more like in style with the scientific papers. And in principle, anyone can send in review comments and the draft will be made available to a large number of experts. Um, there, there is this, this uh, 
thing to note that the review comments will be publicly available, as will the answers to the review comments. And therefore, of course, it makes sense that, that uh, if you want to review these reports, that you actually have something to say, which this is not um, making your life more difficult afterwards. So therefore, typically, it will be people with a background and, uh, that allows them to come with comments on the science that's being done. Uh, and when this is dealt with, a second order draft is sent to governments and the experts uh, for simultaneous review. The governments would, of course, you will not have your uh, prime minister or minister of climate or whoever that is to read it. It will be the civil servants and often they will ask um, national experts from universities or meteorological services to, to do that review for them. And that's what they often do. They try to pass it on to uh, to these experts. In order to look at these the, the these reviewers, the expert reviewers, then when the comments get back, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little in a short while, they have to be there have to be re replies to each of these uh, um, suggestions for for changes or or the comments. And, and that is a challenge because there are really many comments and uh, particularly it's important that there are several steps. So we have this first order and second order draft that uh, replies that are, are being done in the first round should not be sort of uh, um, by chance uh, be answered contradictorily in the second time around. And that's the role of a set of review editors that uh, that assist uh, to, to to responsible for monitoring how how the response to the review comments are and ensuring that the comments receive careful response. Uh, this is intended to be const constructive role. It says it says so. Uh, there is actually very little role apart from checking that the review comments are being dealt with from the review editors. But uh, every now and then there are certain elements of the review process that can be very tedious and very complex and therefore making sure that the appropriate answering is done uh, is, is the role of these review editors. So how does it all work? Um, oops, sorry for this. Um, <clears throat> for the uh, six assessment report, the whole thing was initiated back in 2017 when, when there was uh, a scoping meeting and the, and the outline of the reports were, were agreed to. And then the authors and the, the whole team are being selected and people are around where they apply and say that they would like to be part of it. And then the, in this case where we are moving on from 2018 to 2021, the first lead author meeting took place uh, just about um, three years ago in Gangzhou in China. Um, and this is where the plans and assigning task with its team is done. So that's mainly the authors, review editors are not yet uh, part of this. Uh, then a second uh, lead author meeting took place in January. So uh, a little, almost two and a half years ago in Vancouver. And there the idea is to produce the first order draft. That's now it's, it's towards the draft that will go to, to, um, to peer review. Um, therefore, there's a number of rules that also are being implemented. For example, uh, all literature that would be cited will need to be published or available in draft form by when this is, is, is there. So you, you cannot have citing papers that are on the way uh, and somebody is uh, is thinking of writing um, and therefore there's a to be able to do that the, the papers that are being cited if they are not published they have to be made available so these elements are starting to become serious you cannot just write what you think yourself is the, is the stuff it has to be backed up on literature all through what exists um, a third meeting uh, took place uh, in August two years ago in Toulouse, and that's uh, for that's where you deal with the uh, the, uh, the first order draft to to deal with those review comments and revise the chapter so it can uh, produce the second order draft. 
and, and this is now also starting to feed into what's called the summary for policymakers and the technical summary. So at this stage, the, the chapter should be in, in a form that allows you to extract what you could call an executive summary with some statements like those that I quoted in the very beginning from, from uh, the, the role of uh, anthropogenic uh, influence in the climate system. Uh, and that's where the at this meeting the 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 summary of policymakers and technical summary starts to be assembled. And then uh, a fourth meeting was uh, was scheduled last year in June, and as you know, that did not happen. Uh, there was uh, due to the pandemic uh, a lot of changes also to this process and. Uh, the, these meetings that where people meet and travel all around the world to to meet became online and to be honest nobody thought this would work um, there are two reasons why it actually does work and that is that most countries these days actually have internet connections that most of the day will allow you to to be uh, uh, to hook up and be part of the meeting um, it also put an extra load on everyone because when you meet physically at least everybody is jet lagged to the same level. But of course, with the, 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 in the event of much less travel, of course, you have a, a, a total different uh, agenda. And actually being an author starts not to be uh, an element where you, are, you yourself contribute largely to the emissions of carbon dioxide, simply because you can now sit uh, at your own office and, and do your, your work from your computer. Um, however, it is an extra load. Meetings will cannot be condensed to, let's say, four days, five days. Uh, nobody will get up at the middle of the night every day. So therefore, the meetings were scheduled. So typically, the meetings are two weeks instead. And you have sessions um, changing from one day to the other so that the time zones are changing. So all this gets a little complicated, but it's doable. And I think this is going to happen in the future. We will see much more meetings that will take advantage of this, this way of, of sitting together. Um, I will say that there was, is this element that you do, to build the trust, it probably will be needed that you at least have the first meeting where you can meet colleagues you've never seen before. Um, so instead, these uh, became you know, online meetings and uh, that, that introduced an additional meeting in February, online meetings, so that were more meetings. But uh, here in March, this report was finished. So, so this is just telling you the schedule all to get this together. People really have to make sure that their agenda is, uh, is ready for this. You simply cannot have anyone being delayed because uh, that's too complex a, a procedure to do. So uh, here in July and uh, in uh, early August, it will now be a meeting in which the working group, one session of government representatives will meet and do an approval of the summary for policymakers line by line uh, to accept the underlying report. And when this is happening, there will be at least one of the coordinating lead authors from each of the chapter present at the meeting. And, and, and there will be a meeting, in, uh, a pre-meeting, so that uh, everybody's up to speed on where, where there might be issues that will be discussed. And I will get back a little bit to how this works. So this is just an outline of the report that comes uh, in this, uh, for, for this time around. Uh, I'm not going into the details, but you can see there is a number of chapters that goes uh, on the typical stuff, but there's also, um, is a shift towards um, bringing more information in, in line with the risk uh, that's used in, in, in working group two and also in terms of informing working group three better. And, and therefore, there's also now this atlas that uh, uh, I mentioned before, which is a chapter in itself and then has this online interaction version. This is just to, to, to let you know what the Atlas team look like. Uh, this, I'm not going to in the details with this, but this is the current version of what I'm involved with. And therefore, 
um, I just wanted to let you know very briefly who they are. As you can see, there is a number of uh, countries in bold. Uh, people from all over the world are being part of, of the drafting team. And uh, you should expect to be able to find information about different regions and subregions in this atlas. This is the executive summary, as it looks. As you can see, I've almost, almost uh, made it impossible to read, simply because uh, at this stage, it's not possible to cite, quote, or distribute the summary for policymakers. So that would be a breach if that happens. And of course, it already has happened. There are people who have made it available, so you can go and find it on the net. But of course, this document doesn't exist yet. Doesn't, it only exists once it's approved by governments. So how does this work then? The, it, it, I'll just, what, what does this take? So uh, let's, let's start it again. So um, um, there's a little older stuff, and that's what I said. This is the AR4 from 2007. And I'm, I'm just checking on my time, sorry. So I need to figure out where we are. Okay, good. So, um, Let's start again. We go back to the AR4, which is, was in 2007. This, in this case, I was a coordinating lead author, and you can even see that the, this there has been some development. My hair is a uh, more white. Um, this is the team for the regional chapter when we met for the first lead author meeting in Trieste. Uh, the scope was to have 60 pages. Uh, including everything and and this is basically who who arrived and took part in this first meeting one of the challenges is uh, at those days where we didn't have really good uh, internet connections and certainly things like zoom or even skype was in the early days um, and which in some parts of the world not at all functioning so these were the these are the plot, this, the spots where our colleagues were sitting and and uh, working together with such a team is a bit of a, a challenge because it's almost impossible to make a meeting where everybody can make it a telephone meeting that is so our second meeting was in Beijing and um, you may already see that uh, more people managed to make that meeting uh, than on the first picture. Um, but at the same time, um, you may also maybe see a little more energy and hopefully you can see such a development as we move forward. This meeting in Beijing was uh, the second order, second meeting and that's where the response to the first order draft and uh, working towards the second order draft was initiated. So what we managed to send out for the first order draft at the time was 205 pages that went to review, and that was including text tables and figures, which was um, uh, received back 147 pages of comments. Uh, in total, that's 1,458 views. And this is an example one. The chapter is written very nicely, taking into account most of the important achievements during the last years. Or how about this one? It was a privilege to read and review this chapter. And then something like this, all the many claims of what is likely have no scientific basis. These were just extracts. Some of them were much more directly to the text itself, but uh, just to let you know that some of them are really, uh, I would say, tough to deal with, others is more simple. And then something like this, I estimate the chapter is about 48% over target length at present. So this next version obviously need to be reduced in, in uh, length. After the meeting or after some time, then again, a new version was to be submitted. 155 pages went out for review, so second order. That was a 25% reduction, not quite was as suspected. The rest we wanted to do in the final round. And then the, the chapter had to host additional information. And then the help was that supplementary information was invented. It's possible to store stuff in a supplementary element. To do this, uh, reaching the second order draft to submit it, 
Well, I uh, did a little statistics on the number of emails that I received. 927 to this draft alone. And out of those, between the 1st of January and the 6th of March, when it was uh, submitted, there was uh, 609. And then the last five, six days, I received 245. And basically, it's about the same that has to be sent out, at least in the end. And uh, that mean, meant that it was uh, quite uh, time consuming. There's really a lot to take care of. So that basically for that version, I had to prioritize my time to do that all the way from January to March. So at least 50% of my work time for this uh, part and uh, then 90% in the last couple of weeks and 99% in the last week or two, even all my time, of course, it's not possible to do in normal work hours. So actually the last part close to the submission, there was not much sleep at all. Also keep in mind that being in touch with people around the world, that was interesting, that when somebody's going to sleep, somebody else is waking up. The final meeting, when uh, the whole thing was uh, to be revised for the last time, that was taking place in Norway. And uh, this is the team at this event. And maybe when we compare these, these two team um, pictures, there is a tendency to see that, well, there is actually something that happened socially. It was not just a random selection of people. We actually got to know one another and work together. That that was very important. And uh, I have to say that that's very tough to imagine that this will, will happen to the same degree. Now everything will be online. And then in this case, we said 159 pages were went out to review, 140 page uh, for comments. In this case, we got a little more reviews, things like this one. As an overall impression, the chapter is excellent in nature and extremely rich in detail. Uh, the inclusion of better regional projection is an important advance, blah, 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 blah. A lot of much more detailed comments. And then something like this, that the entire executive summary is weak. It has a general review, but no real uh, executive summary points. It needs some snappy new results. Blah, 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 blah. So work to do. The links had to be reduced further. The, the sections had to be homogenized which is our last year editorial and therefore come back on the coordinating uh, lead authors. And then a reorganization to make the assessment points more catchy. That uh, resulted in 131 pages, uh, implying the reduction of was met. Uh, we had hosted additional things and some uh, and, uh, supplementary information. In the end, uh, that resulted in 95 printed pages, which was actually what was the target. And more important as a scientist and as a lead author was that there was element from this chapter that made it all the way to the summary of policymakers. And that's my final real thing to, to mention here is what is this summary of policymakers. Well, this is happening in a plenary where the summary has already been in the version that went for review and the review comments come back. And then this is uh, for each this section in this summary. In this case, it's a summary where this the section that relies on the chapter nine is being discussed. Um, I, this, this is an animation, but unfortunately, I think I lost the video, so I only have this, pi this picture. And in fact, nothing goes on. So what's happening is that the whole, the whole uh, SPM is being uh, displayed in the room and edited. So you go line by line and everybody agrees in the end that now this is, uh, this is the text we want. And of course, it cannot be random what's happening there. The, the lead authors that are responsible for the sections are in the room. And of course, they guarantee that the text will be as it's supposed to be. If, if, if somebody wants to introduce a garbage or wrong statements, it's not going to happen. But Typically, things are, and I take this example here, discernible, discernible human influence now extend to other aspects of climate, including ocean warming, continental average temperatures, temperature extremes, and patterns. And you can see that some words have been changed. For example, atmospheric circulation. That's a typical Jens 
word that's what i would be using my scientific jargon jargon but we could use the word wind instead that uh, doesn't change the content in fact it makes it it's easier to comprehend for for people when, without the, the the special knowledge that we have in in my discipline likewise other elements of that are typically a lot of that is uh, is just rewording using better words and of course every now and then there is a, an element that needs uh, further discussion i would have to say that it seemed to be more discussions within working group one in the first three assessment reports than was the case for the fourth and the fifth and uh, this uh, has now reached uh, the end of my presentation i just want to flash this cartoon that uh, appeared uh, very close to the when the, the last report was issued so here we see the little scientist from ipcc in his um, laboratory coat stating so this climate change thing could be a problem and five years later yes definitely a problem and yet another six years yep we should really be getting on with the sorting this out pretty soon and um, 2007 look uh, sorry to sound like a broken record here but uh, in 13 we really have checked and we are not making this up and uh, i suppose this could be what's coming next or that's uh, of course up to you to judge that's the end of my presentation yeah okay first of all thank you very very much for this interesting lecture um i learned a lot and it's very interesting to learn about the creation of the ipc report in the background and i think it showed very good how much work is in there and organizational and also teamwork and yeah how scientific work is done yeah thank you very much and yeah i encourage everyone again to write uh, his or her questions in the q a box and yeah, then I will read out the questions and yeah, you can also vote up or down. And I will start. Um, the first question is, what was the biggest challenge you featured in IPCC? Yeah, there, there are two levels. So so the, it's, it's a big challenge to, to actually get people to work together. Uh, I mean, this this is this is not this is not unique. Sorry for the dog, but um, now we know that I have a dog, um, and uh, so so to get people to work together, that's of course not unique to the IPCC, but it's a challenge that uh, some of your colleagues would one would be in in Senegal, one would be in Mexico, one in Argentina. Uh, it's also, also very exciting, but the, the challenge here is that uh, we have very different cultures and uh, some of our colleagues will will have a total different expectations of uh, what is the leader's role so so that that was a i think that was a big challenge to to learn um, i think I, I had a much better picture the second time i was a coordinating lead author about those elements of getting a team to work together the first time where that was the the fourth assessment report that i reported on here that was a it was a challenge that i was not aware of why for example some colleagues that i knew as as very 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 stable very very um, uh, intelligent and smart guys women uh, they actually did not deliver when we when they were asked to do so because uh, they they were used to a different style where the their professor or boss would dictate them what to do. So I had to f play that little game and figuring out with my my co-lead uh, a little bit of exercise. I think people call it good cop, bad cop kind of way. So that uh, pushing some pressure and at the same time 
trying to 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 be kind enough to realize that you have to come up with your own stuff so so that was on the sort of the intellectual personal level the other challenge was um of course the whole communication issue afterwards um i would i was not totally prepared for the big fuss that was around the force assessment report when it was when it came out so i was part of the the, the final meeting that took place place in paris and then there was a press release afterwards but it was a uh, I mean, I did some interviews before. I've been in television, radio, talked to journalists, but this was, it was, a, it was like a sports star. Uh, and I never tried it before. So that was, a, it was a little, uh, I would say it was, it was over the hill uh, that I was, I had to attend uh, interviews and show up myself at the, in the middle of the night to, to, to being interviewed remotely and things like that. That, that was a big challenge. And uh, I, I think I was fortunate to be able to do a good job. So I communicated. Uh, so 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 the audience and the journalists in in my country, who typically were it was mostly Danes, but there were a few international um, interviews as well. Uh, they 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 both basically uh, accepted, I would say, my expertise. So they did not start to question me. They did not put me in a situation where I was put in a in a difficult situation that's uh, I know a lot of other colleagues have uh, encountered that um, so so in that sense I think those were the two major issues that it's uh, all of a sudden this thing that you become uh, I would say a, a a known person outside your your scientific environment that's uh, I don't think I, I was not prepared for that. And I think a lot of colleagues are not prepared for that. It's very difficult to figure out what it means that all of a sudden you deal with media and uh, you have to, if you don't have a strategy, you end up being sucked up with a lot of interviews and, and you want to please people, but maybe maybe you cannot do that. So long, long answers, but these were, I think, good, good, good questions too. So uh, um, Yeah, very interesting. It shows very good that it needs kind of more skills than the scientific background, like bleeding or communication skills. Yeah. Um, thank you. There's a question that is like, uh, I think it can connect a little bit. Um, it's how do you handle discussions with climate crisis deniers? Yeah, that, this is also, that's an interesting question because that, I, I, I think I have a, a, I'm a, I'm a, I live in a, in a country where, where this, uh, there has overnight basically been a, a shift. Uh, that was about the same time that before that there was a, 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 every time there was something in the news about uh, climate change, I was, I was often asked to be interviewed and even attend uh, uh, direct sendings by news media and things, but there will always be another quite famous Dane who was used to be called a skeptical environmentalist. Uh, he wrote a book like this and his name is Björn Lomborg. And, and he, he, he's, he's very gifted uh, rhetorically, which means that uh, he, he, he's very difficult to, to be in a debate with. And so how did I deal with this? Well, eventually I found out that this was not about coming with the punchline argument. This was about saying the same thing again and again and again and again and again and uh, in, like in the drawing, and and it's that's that has been very helpful and uh, basically not to go into a real I would say debate where where I have spent time trying to uh, turn away arguments that that the opponents might have because it's it's not helpful. They they they, they would just have additional stuff that take, can take a very long time to explain why they are wrong so it's it's better to say what's uh, what's right uh, and keep saying that and yes in the end somebody will still be voting from from for uh, donald trump or whoever you do not like in germany or in denmark but that's part of democracy we we have to cope mm -hmm. with all those we do not agree with yeah Right, I think everybody knows this. <laughs> um, okay, thanks. 
Um, the next question is, um, by what process is decided what lead authors or publications to take part in the report? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. I think most most of what goes on with the IPCC is 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 made very transparent. Um, you you can you can access the information. You can that there are two things you cannot that that's not uh, easy to access, and the, one of them is the lead author meetings. There you simply need time to be able to do your stuff. You won't have time to have the people coming around and see what goes on. I see no reason why this should not happen because nothing secret is happening. But they, I mean, it's it's a secret when you cannot see what's going on. And the same goes, of course, with the summary for policymakers approval. And then, how does the uh, process of of selecting the the lead authors take place? Well, the call is there's a there is a focal point in all countries where they will send out to scientists an invitation that they can voluntarily uh, say that they want to be offer their CV for, for being elected as a lead author or CLA. And then uh, then it's up to the co-chairs to, to establish a team. Now, at the same time, the, what you, you want two things to happen. You want to have a team that has the, the best scientific knowledge about the subject so that they can actually assess and not just collect material. Um, but of course, that's a limitation. You have, uh, if all the experts are living in Denmark, but um, so so you you would not put fifteen authors from Denmark together. You also have to take some people from elsewhere. And uh, frankly, colleague, our colleagues in, in in Africa are really underrepresented. They're, we have very good colleagues, but but many of them will not have a very impressive CV, and oftentimes they will have to pick up a job back in their country, which of course they are happy to, to serve as in the meteorological service or something. And then they, they end up being elected, perhaps simply just because they come from this country so that they can have that balance. And likewise, some of the, uh, I mean, the, the, if, it, if it was really people's CV, then it would be a bunch of, of whitehead uh, old guys, the usual suspects that would write everything. So, so that's uh, these elements goes into it. So, so sometimes you have to bypass some of the, so some of the uh, strong CVs simply to put the team together, and that that is uh, with the co-chairs. They they want, of course, they objectively don't know everybody in the world, so they will they will see what has come from the um, what's being forwarded from the focal points. That's the that's the each each members of the IPCC has a focal point. And uh, and they will come with with names and some recommendations. They would, and of course, you could always question how this is done. This is a uh, pro that process is not entirely open. It's it's we try to I will say we now because uh, in most countries in Europe see no reason why this should not be an open process. But I could imagine that we have other countries where this being so open is perhaps not part of the tradition, and. Uh, so in that sense, so uh, that's how it's being decided. And then at the same time, the, the, the whole report, so that for working group one, for example, you have to have a balance that you have the proper UN representation of different countries, different gender, different, even religion actually plays a role here, although that's very little religion in science. And then when, then they come, then the, the co-chairs from the different working groups compare if there is a balance across, so these these are all things that are less obvious how this is done. Then how do you kick out someone because working group three needs somebody from Zimbabwe or whatever? I mean, this is um, that 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 I don't think we will find a way how this can be transparent. But that's basically the process. It's 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 largely due to the CV of of the of the expert. Mm -hmm. They have like um, a question directly. Is it uh, do the authors can apply or do they uh, only can get into this teams by invitation? So 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 this is so you this, this is by invitation. So it's you apply, you, you forward your CV, and then uh, then the, the, the co-chairs will try to establish the team, and you will if you submitted your CV and uh, your interest in this, 
then you will have, you will have an email uh, reply at some point that you get an invitation to, to join. And of course, the CLA roles is something which is being discussed, and they, they want to make sure that you understand what what this actually uh, entails, including the time I was mentioning, because that's uh, the commitment. Uh, I was now now shifting from sitting at the med service to now to the university. I can see that I was very privileged at the, at the med service because I just had my work being done by somebody else. And uh, as a professor at the university, this is not happening. If, if I'm doing things for IPCC, this is on my own time uh, only. And uh, of course, I can do a little bit in there's freedom in, in my research as well. But it, it takes, it's more complicated uh, for university. And it's even complicated in many countries to, to attend meetings, for example. You have to have funding available. And um, well, this is another reason why the online meetings, of course, is, uh, is an advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems yeah, to take very much time and work. Um, there's a question also related to this. Um, it's asked, uh, do the civilian servants uh, who work on the reports get paid by the IPCC? No, there, there's no money involved, so that's... Uh, you, what you could say is that you will be paid by your, your in, employer. So as I just mentioned it, I was when I was at the med service, I was uh, I was supported by my my institute. They would they they found it very relevant to have uh, that expert and that uh, that would be key visibility within Denmark um, and internationally, but mostly within Denmark, of course, was really relevant to them. So in that sense, they paid my salary to do what I did, but the IPCC do not have any money. They, there is a trust trust fund related to the IPCC where uh, uh, colleagues from the developing countries can can get money to travel or to to attend meetings and things like that. But uh, otherwise, there is there's very little money in the IPCC. In fact, uh, sometimes some of the even the coaches can have difficulties in in attending those meetings they're supposed to attend. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. It shows a lot of motivation. That's obviously not financial. And yeah, um, the next question is, um, the comment of the IPCC draft sound interesting. Can people possibly access it? Yes, it's possible. To, one has to approach the um, the IPCC, and uh, I, I, I have never tried it myself. But it's, uh, it's 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 it is open. It's available. You can you you. I think you have to to let them know why you want to do it, and therefore you have uh, then you will have get, be, be granted access to see the the, re, the the review comments as well as the answers to the review. So this this is uh, part of the transparency that you can actually see this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are quite some questions. Um, you mentioned it is very important to use precise language um, since English is the language of science, but generally not the mother tongue for many people. Would you say that using precise language is a general problem in, in today's science? I, th I think it's a problem in, in many many aspects of science, but even with even among uh, native speaking English people, because having a calibrated language, for example, could be so. So what do if we use the word significant, which is a typical word that's being used and and for within natural sciences, this typically will mean that you will have a, a statistical uh, analysis what, by which uh, you, you you to a certain degree say that this is significant that means that it you you the, the results are reliable uh, and that that comes up with quantitative measures of the, the probability of of this to be right is 1995 percent or something like that which means there is actually a chance of five percent that you are wrong so so that type of um, um elements are, are are in that precise language the other part is that that for example, the many of the, I mean, the the, the summary for policymakers is always uh, translated into the official UN languages, and uh, I can just uh, let you know how I, I worked to, to with colleagues in Denmark to translate it into Danish, and that's a problem 
because uh, some of the the words that from 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 the science we do not have a Danish word, and I even think it's the same in German that that there's there's so many languages or so many words that are just we use them because that we have not identified what is the appropriate in our native language. And I think that that is an issue uh, in general when it comes to something like this, which has to be policy relevant, because when it's policy relevant, then clearly, even though you have a, a, a counselor who, who speaks English, that's not the case everywhere. Uh, and uh, even even you do not necessarily have a counselor or a prime minister who has a degree. I mean, this is this is uh, it's 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 tough to have that language translated into something that makes sense. So I think, particularly when it has uh, have when this all has these elements that relate to to decision making, then I think it is an issue that we um, language is is um, is not precise. Okay. Yeah, quite a common problem. Um, thank you. The next question is, um, as shown in the last cartoon, I think it's cartoon, mm -hmm. I don't know, the different IPCC reports underline and repeat that climate change is an important issue. How does it feel repeating the same sad facts again and again over the years without seeing enough action from governments and people? Well, I'm, I'm, there are two ways to this. But first of all, there has been a lot of development. I mean, there are. I agree that we, we don't see that much action, but it's not totally true. We actually do see a lot of policies that are being um, developed, but they have not all been implemented. Um, and some of this just simply just take time. At least I've, that's that much I've I've I've, I've learned is that. Well, except for things like uh, shutting down society because of a coronavirus, then then very nearly everything else takes a lot of time because we there are too many people who want to be part of the decision making process, and when you shortcut it, it can be done. And I think the positive side of Corona is actually that we now know that governments can do much more than they do, and they know it themselves. So that means that. Um, but the, but it takes a democratic process. You cannot dictate that people should be vegans or um, never ever fly or things like that. It, it has to come a it has to come through a, a substantial uh, development and accept. I mean, otherwise people will not buy it. Um, that will be too 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 diverse. And this unfortunately takes time. Um, and I think. I mentioned that I, I lived in a country where there was there was this flip from listening to the skeptics and not doing it anymore. There was a major change uh, in in the mid around the time for for this for the force assessment report across Europe, where many countries shifted towards thinking about making plans on how we could uh, reduce and get the next step, how to get the Paris Agreement. Um, but then, of course, there are still a lot of countries where the, they need to go much further down the development route first. And, and that's the problem with international uh, development is that uh, it doesn't come overnight. It really takes time. And uh, I have to say that I've, I mean, the number of solar pallets, uh, panels and windmills and things like this it is increasing and there's a lot that have shown that you can make businesses with this of course it's not going as fast as a lot of people would like it to do um i have no i, I cannot say that it's it will happen but my feeling is that this, this this is a snowball that's rolling and a lot of this is happening but it's it just takes time we we, we have to accept that that those plans that ha that has attacked time tax since 2030 that is actually 2030. It's not tomorrow, and and uh, uh, that's that's just maybe, maybe it's just because that I've I've seen it happening so slowly that I can actually see things are happening much faster now, even things being implemented. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the scale yet where where it really matters. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's quite uh, difficult sometimes from the outside to see these actions, but very interesting to see you from the inside. <laughs> um, okay, then uh, the next question is, how did your work change over the time? Yeah, that's, um, how did it change? Um, first, a couple of elements. First, first when I was first uh, got involved with IPCC, it, it clearly was uh, very exciting and everything was very new and it was a learning by doing and I had no clue whatsoever. I could not have given a lecture like this. <laughs> so, I mean, I wouldn't know, I simply wouldn't understand how the process was. So, so, so my work uh, within the IPCC has changed in the sense that I'm, I now understand, so to say, the rules. I understand why the establishment is the way it is. Um, I can also say that I've, I've, uh, I've learned to appreciate the other side, that is the, the re recipients of this information, that a lot of our, uh, some of them are colleagues from university previously, who are now uh, having the role as a civil servant in, in, in the ministry. Uh, they are trying their very best to do what they can do in informing and, and getting this message back. So there's a lot of serious stuff that I was not aware of before. So this has changed my way of, um, I would say, my patience has grown. I, so this, this comes back to the question from before. So may, maybe I just seen how difficult it is and realizing that a lot of people are really trying their utmost to, to make things different. Um, it's very difficult to see that it's happening. And, and uh, in, in, in scientifically, I don't think I've changed a lot. I mean, I'm still doing the same type of uh, main themes on my research, but in terms of uh, communicating, um, the two elements that have changed, one is that I've done it many times. So this thing of being interviewed by television, for example, is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not so, I'm not, not so obsessed about it. I've, in the beginning, I felt this was Jesus. They want to see me and they'd want to talk to me. That was great. Uh, this sort of prime time feeling that was, I, I can see what happens to people when they get into this. But, but now I realize that the, the best way to use this is actually to be able to, I have to, I have, to have something to communicate. So it's not just that a journalist thinks it's relevant that I communicate. So that, that's a different uh, attitude. And part of it has to do with the experience. The other part is probably just that um, I'm getting older all the time, like you are, <laughs> except that I'm much older. Yeah, thank you for this answer. I think it's very encouraging to hear it. Yeah, and maybe a little different view than, yeah, than other times. Mm, yeah, then the next question is um, how IPCC is searching several climate technologies like carbon capture technologies and reporting governments after SOD? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we should keep in mind that the IPCC is, is uh, what, it's, what it's doing is that, that it's, uh, it's, it's basically collecting the evidence that that uh, has been published in scientific papers and, and put that uh, in statements of uh, that, that would lead to uh, what could be done. So if it's carbon capture technologies, um, that, that, is, that is part of the, that will be part of the working group three to some extent also on working group two to, to report on, on that. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be a lot of that in the chapter and maybe, and, and it even goes to the summary of policymakers, but it will not come, come with prescriptions. The same goes with other geoengineering approaches that there's a, the scientific literature is there. Uh, then of course it's, it's uh, up to the authors to assess whether these, these uh, whether they will work, whether they, uh, what, what are the issues uh, related to it, but it will not be to judge whether one should go one way or the other. So there will be no recommendation. The recommendation will be with those who see this and may see it as an option. Now, and, and, and the citizen, then you can decide to say, I think it's a bad idea. 
but that that is not as an IPCC author. It's because you you you, you as an individual can can relate to what you are, what you write and what you feel. I mean, the, ideally, IPCC has no role as um, being policy prescriptive. So so uh, that's that's another thing that can be, and that's particular within working group two and three, much more of an issue because. Uh, sometimes it's almost impossible not to, to write what should be done because it's so obvious. But I mean, it's it's somewhat easier within working group one where we basically report on on things like the, the, the globe has warmed and uh, mm. this is what it's going to look like in the future. And then, of course, one assessment is that we, we do assess that that mankind is responsible for most of these changes. And that 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 evidence comes from bringing together information, knowledge about the climate system, but also about how the processes work and such like. But this is not this is actually not giving any um, suggestions to decision makers on what they should do about it. it it's just listing the facts. Yeah, this answers also the next question. It was like, um, are there any suggestions? I think uh, yeah, you said it. And then uh, the question is also, how do governments work to decide for funding the solution um, which IPCC has suggested? Or yeah, yeah that's so, so. So so, and this is this is also where there is a, often two things are sort of uh, um, mixed in the understanding. So there, there is a the other body that that's important to to note here is that's what's called the conference of the parties. Or the, that they, they, this is an, an biannual meeting where where the parties, those are the ones that actually signed the uh, UN um, uh, 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 Combat Climate Change uh, Protocol, and and uh, they meet twice a year, and, uh, and 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 one of those cups, that's where the Paris Agreement came, but uh, but at, at the same time that's that's heavily influenced by the ipcc report so the ipcc intergovernmental panel clearly um, talks together with the with the decision makers that are sitting in the the framework convention and uh, having their meetings so so it informs the, the the schedule is is established to inform the the, the framework convention on its work so so that's a uh, so that, that's shifting over to that so if you want to Funding the solution or pay for it. Uh, this is happening under that umbrella, which is the framework convention, and 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 then of course this is where the scientists are in general not part of it anymore. But sometimes there is an overlap. Some some scientists turn out to be engaged in politics as well, and then you may see them in UN F Triple C. Uh, and I know of a couple of, uh, of of Germans, of course, who have. Who have those several roles every now and then? So, um, but uh, I haven't had the, that call on me yet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think yeah, we have one or two questions left. Um, is there an obligation from governments or other official institutions to read the report? If if the if you could say that if the, if countries are member of the IPCC, it's likely that they would at least attend the, the the plenary where it's going to be approved. And and I can say that uh, not all countries will send a representative. So there is a good chance that we have countries, uh, particularly in developing countries, that are not attending. Um, but but then again, you would see some of the where you we had a little bit of discussion about with the deniers and so on and so forth. There are also countries who have a vast interest in seeing these reports being downplayed as much as possible. And I, I don't think I'm, I'm I'm telling a big secret by saying that Saudi Arabia and Kuwait are not too happy about these reports. At least they used not to be. They, they, I think even even these countries are seeing that well, maybe maybe we should try to reorganize our own way and and and, and have a, a development uh, that being said doesn't mean that they're switching off their oil, but uh, 
it, it means that they are looking in other direction and want to, to spend efforts to try to see if they can do other things. And so that's in that sense, they are not so much naysayers at the meetings, um, but uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that they will try to push still, still as much as possible to keep it balanced. And by saying that, I don't mean that, <coughs> excuse me, that that they are right in what they're doing. I'm just saying that they 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 have an agenda, that's for sure, and uh, they they try to 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 work for that. Likewise, we have other countries that have another agenda that wants to see a much much faster transition. Um, and this, of course, but that's what this is now where we move away from the IPCC and over to the. Uh, to the U, to, to, to the to the conference of the parties instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There are different interests from yeah different countries and might influence their acceptance or yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I come to the last question. I think it's perfect for our time. <laughs> um, a few years ago, there was a big wave of criticism on IPCC due to what I would consider minor mistakes. Do you think the work of IPCC is appreciated enough? I think I think it's largely appreciated. I think it's uh, the, the, the in, in, if we really want to cut it into big politics, um, then I think uh, that the big players, let's say that that's basically China, US, EU, uh, India, Brazil, Russia, if if they are not interested in the messages, then they do whatever they want. But their own scientists and their scientific understanding of the situation is the same. I mean, this is this is what I reported and what we report in the IPCC reports. Well, you won't find find many people who oppose those stand, that, that, those point of views neither in China nor in Brazil, whatever, that they, they will have this, they will come to the same conclusions. So the difference is that they would, they would better know how to deal with their leaders and how to communicate with them. And uh, if they want to see changes, that's another issue, of course. So, so um, in the end, this, this is, uh, that's the big difference across, I think, that is that we have, uh, we, we are not, doing the same thing in different countries. We won't respond to the knowledge we have in the same way. There are so many other agendas. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I think that's maybe a good word for um, our uh, final, for the, for the final. <laughs> and yeah, I would like to thank you again very much for your lecture and yeah, for me, it also it was an honor to have you here. And thank you also uh, for our audience uh, for listening. Um, yes, and I have some announcements. Um, uh, the next week is also our lecture, and uh, next week it will be Dr. Heidrun Moschitz um, with the topic What's the role of cities in sustainable food systems? Um, yeah, and as I said, we will upload this lecture uh, on the video portal, but it can take some time. And for our viewers also, uh, you're very welcome to send us feedback via email. Um, yeah, if you have anything. And then there are two announcements for um, at yeah, the end. Uh, there are also Nachhaltigkeitstage Light. It's from the Öko-Referat. And the next two days, there will be further presentations and workshops about sustainability. And you can uh, see it at stuve.v.de, Nachhaltigkeitstageleit. And also there is, um, I think, a sustainable education um, on the 25th of June. And it, it's online. Yeah, it's a award ceremony and a workshop with uh, professors. And you have to register, and yeah, it's just open for members uh, of FAO. Okay, so I think that was it for today.